bringing shadows into light. The year of 1848 is a decisive point of departure in the evolution of Mexican-American art in California. In January, gold was discovered in the Sierra Nevada foothills of Northern California, participating a major influx of entrepreneurs, adventurers, and settlers from all regions of the country coming to the West to re reinvent themselves and reap a part of the gold bonanza. Simultaneously, on February 12, 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, terminating the United States-Mexico War, was signed. The treaty ceded California together with the geographic area that would become the American Southwest to the United States. As the Americanization of California proceeds, Spanish-Mexican cultural institutions like missions, ranchos, presidios, and vernacular arts and architecture receive as relics of an agrarian past no longer pertinent to the wake of Anglo-American progress except as a nostalgic reference. Photography, recently invented by Daguerre in Paris in 1839, and lithography become favorite visual genres to illustrate newspapers that herald the rise of Yankee enterprise in California and invite more newcomers to come and share in the gold bonanza. By the latter part of the 19th century, San Francisco is a bohemian uh, boomtown with an embryonic arts community. Artists work as illustrators for a growing publishing industry and create portraits, landscapes, and genre scenes for an incipient art market. Art patronage develops as a civic and civilizing ritual among the newly rich. Soon there are yearly art fairs, small commercial galleries, and art columns in local publications. In 1848, the School of Design is inaugurated as the first art school on the West Coast, today known as the San Francisco Art Institute. The cosmopolitan bohemian atmosphere of the city by the bay attracts artists from throughout the Americas. As the 19th century wanes, bringing modernist art to California, a few Mexican-born artists living and working in the Bay Area, like Fortunato Reola, Javier Martinez, and others participate centrally in the local artistic circles. They exhibit in the galleries and art fairs, have studios, mentor younger artists, and are antecedents in the evolutions of Mexican-American visual culture. So the first person I'm going to talk briefly and just give some anecdotes is Fortunato Reola, whose picture you have on the front page. Fortunato Reola was a Mexican-born, self-taught artist who participated in the art circles of Northern California in the mid-19th century. Most of what is known about Areola's biography is related in a book called Memoirs by Tony Rosenthal, who studied portraiture with Areola in San Francisco. Fortunato Areola was born in 1827 to a prosperous family in Casala, Sinaloa, Mexico. Areola came to San Francisco in 1857 and was kept busy painting street scenes, romantic tropical landscapes, and portraits of the uh, vanishing Californios and of rich new patrons who had struck it rich in the California gold mines. Published accounts describe Areola's studio as a lively gathering spot for adventurers from the East Coast, Mexican exiles, and local bohemians and artists. With an established local reputation as a portrait painter, Areola exhibited a self-portrait and eight other portraits at the Mechanics Institute Fair of 1864. His portraits, declared Benjamin Avery in the Overland Richley quote, were among the best in the gallery and were remarkable for attention to detail and successful minor effects. Apart from his portraits, Areola also gained fame for his landscapes, one of which, and I'm sorry it's not in color, I'm just trying to get the, um, the color uh, prints from collections, it's, it's hard. But you see the bottom one on the first page is a kind of tropical landscape that he was, that he was famous for painting. This is, a, this is, remember, this is the 1840s, when landscape was a defining genre in American art, especially because of the, uh, of the vogue for tropical landscapes initiated by Frederick Church on the East Coast. Many of Areola's landscapes are typical examples of a luminous style affecting his interest in the effects of light and atmosphere. This is uh, a, a, an art form in terms of landscape that was very popular at the period. 
Documenting his skills as both a portrait and landscape painter, Areola unites both genres in Tropical Landscape of 1840, which is the one on the second page. Areola's dream of economic success and career recognition soon faded, and he made plans to return to San Francisco on the SS Bienvenida uh, through Panama, via Panama, on August 10, 1872. Five days later, the ship, the ship caught fire in the Bahamas, and Fortunata Reola drowned at sea at the age of 45, tragically ending a promising artistic career. Areola's forte were landscapes and seascapes uh, imbued with mysterious chiaroscuro effects, connoting an almost spiritual bond with nature. The paintings preserve the spirit and aesthetic principles of the American sublime movement, stressing the grandeur of American landscape. Uh, and so remember, this is a time uh, when in America, and particularly on the West Coast, you have you know, church and, and Yosemite Park and all those grandiose sort of scenes, and Ayala was part of that, painting more intimate uh, portraits, but part of that American sublime movement. There's much to be told and much more research to be done, and um, hopefully I will expand upon, I mean, I have expanded, these are just little notes that I took from my larger paper. The next person is a rather more important person that we know a little more about. Uh, Tisoc, Javier Tisoc Martinez, 1869-1948, actually in 1973. And this is uh, the picture that you have of him in his uh, uh, Spanish hat in his sort of bohemian bow tie. San Francisco Bay's Javier Tisoc Martinez was born in Guadalajara, Mexico on February 7, 1869. You might look at the picture and just begin to think about uh, some of these facts. His father was a printer bookbinder and owned a bookshop located on the city's main plaza. Surrounded by books and the bookish conversation of his father's cultivated clientele, Martinez became a curious, inquisitive boy who developed passion for reading, especially poetry. Before graduating from the Liceo, Martinez's mother died, and his father, due to economic and political problems, lost his bookstore. Martinez was placed under the care of his foster parents, Sullivan Coney, who was Mexico's consul general in Paris, and his wife, Rosalia Coney, a distinguished art patron and philanthropist in Guadalajara. Senora Coney was very sympathetic to Martinez's artistic pursuits. When her husband was transferred to the Mexican consulate in San Francisco, Senora Cani persuaded Martinez to join his foster father in California. Once established in the Bay Area, Martinez was enrolled at the California School of Design, later the Mark Hopkins Institute of Art. He studied with Arthur Frank Matthews, one of the most influential California artists at the turn of the century. Martinez was an outstanding student and graduated with honors, obtaining the Avery Gold Medal for Excellence in Anatomy, Painting, and Sculpture. Because of his great artistic promise, his sympathetic foster mother decided to use part of her inheritance to send Martinez to study art in Paris. From 1891 to 1901, Martinez was in Europe, honing his craft, evolving his artistic style, and being indoctrinated, indoctrinated into classical European culture. In Paris, studying at the Col de Beaux-Arts, he was a pupil of Jean-Léon Jérôme and also trained at the Académie Carrière. Paris in 1897 was a brilliant world capital with many international artists clustered in its Latin Quarter. Martinez, with a gregarious personality and a voracious appetite for life, easily became a true bohemian, a habitué of the cafes, music halls, and artistic dance that defined La Vie de Bohème. Roaming around Paris, attending concerts, visiting museums and galleries, Martinez absorbed the modern spirit, even as he honed his academic training steep in classical and neoclassical art traditions. I'm not going to read any more, just to tell you very briefly. As you can see by the two photographs, the next page is uh, his class at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, circa 1898. And Martinez is in the second row, second from the left. And the two uh, classical studies are the kind of, of, of classical art that he was learning. You know, uh, Once the story is that he was at, at the Louvre, painting, copying paintings the way all artists were. And uh, 
John McNeil Whistler stopped by and said, young man, you have a lot of talent. And he remembered that remark, and Whistler will become an influence. The next page, the reason that I'm particularly interested is because of, of the artist that I'm studying, I think he is the one that is more sort of prototypical Chicano. At a particular moment, he changes his name to Tisok, and if you can compare the two photographs, you know, the one, uh, the first one, and now this one, uh, which is from 1926, he started wearing a, a paliacate, you know, let his hair grow long, and became recovering his uh, indigenous, his indigenous uh, uh, heritage. He went to New Mexico and did a lot of studies of, of the indigenous communities and uh, also to Mexico in his later period has a lot of, of uh, Mexican scenes. In 1905, Martinez had a comprehensive exhibit of 25 paintings at the Vickers Atkins and Torrey Gallery in San Francisco where he exhibited local landscapes, Parisian and Mexican scenes, and portraits of local personalities. Um, it, when he comes back to, to California, then he becomes sort of uh, very much involved in, from Paris. He becomes very, he had met actually Diego Rivera in Paris. So he had met the, you know, the international modern artist. And so in Northern California, he then becomes very much in, involved with the, the, the particular landscape tradition that we've, that we've already mentioned. In the later part of his life, during the 1920s, Martinez began as affirming his Mexican, Mestizo, Spanish, and Tarascan Indian heritage. He changed his first name to Tisot, started to wear a, a red paliacate, an Indian headband, around his forehead to tame his mane of dark hair, and began publishing Notas de un Chichimeca in the Hispano-Americano newspaper in San Francisco. The notas contain his poetic musings, political commentary, and information on pre-Columbian culture. The artistic legacy of Javier Tisoc Martinez is richly complex and paradoxical. His European work continues influences and references to 19th century academic artists such as Whistler, subdued color tonalities and atmospheric luminosity, and Monet. As a California regional artist, Martinez's landscapes reflect the overall muted color tone and pictorial effect of tonalism, this American painting style with limited and muted color schemes. And I just want to, like, uh, before I finish, you can look at the last, uh, the only color picture that you have, I hope. This is one of his uh, interesting uh, afternoon in Piedmont, uh, portrait of his wife, Elsie. And you can see uh, a reverberation of, of when Whistler had said, young man, you have a lot of talent. And you can see in some ways this, of course, is sort of has affinities to Whistler's famous painting, Portrait of His Mother, or arrangement in, in, in uh, gray and black. And you can see uh, his wife in these muted tones in the, in the tonalistic style. So um, overall, the form and content of Martinez's oath is conservative, if seen within the, the dictates of early modernism. However, his lifestyle, political concerns, and moral convictions stress his own otherness and constant humanist concern, especially towards American Indian cultures. Like many other Mexican-American artists that would follow after him, Javier Martinez created art from the multiple sources provided by his training while addressing his personal subjectivity rooted in a bicultural reality. The, pas the passing of Javier Tisoc Martinez in 1943 bridges into the Mexican-American generation of artists. In the first half of the 20th century, California became a late-blooming art center, slowly building an infrastructure of museums, galleries, collectors, and the development of a critical discourse on artistic and cultural issues, especially within educational institutions. By mid-century after World War II, returning Mexican-American GIs interested in pursuing artistic careers enrolled in the art departments of the various UC campuses, including Berkeley, Davis, uh, Irvine, San Diego, and Los Angeles, UCLA. A few went to private art schools like Chouinard School of Art, or Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles, or the San Francisco Art Institute, among others. In their individual expressions, Mexican-American artists of the post-war decade, like their antecedents, the two that we just briefly touched on today, in the 19th and early 20th century, mostly internalized 
and experimented with prevalent American art movements uh, that, was taught, that were taught in the art and university art departments of the period. This first small cadre of professional and academically trained artists of Mexican-American generation became the art, the Mexican-American generation, and two forebearers that we've talked about briefly today, and others that we are just uncovering, became the uh, art educators, role models, and mentors, the veteranos, who will inspire and sustain the self-determined Chicano artists of the 1960s. Thank you. Thank you.